Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ergonomics in Design webinar. As your master of ceremonies, we would like first to introduce our... And we are going to be your MC throughout this event. First of all, I want to thank all of you for attending this webinar. But before we start, we would like to read out some rules that should be followed during this event. This are uh... These are the following rules. First, participants are expected to rename the display name according to the following format for UNPAR students, UNPAR underscore NPM underscore name, for public participants, affiliation underscore name. Second, participants are expected to turn on cameras and turn off the microphone during the event. In the Q&A session, participants can turn on the microphone after being allowed by MC. Third, participants must speak in English. And fourth, at the end of this event, participants are allowed to fill the attendance form to, to claim the e-certificate. Well, that's all the rules that are needed to be obeyed for this event. I'm sure we are all ready to start this exciting webinar. But before we jump into the main sessions, we are welcoming Dr. Teddy Yogasara as the head of Center for Ergonomics at Industrial Engineering Parahyangan Catholic University 2019 until 2021 to give a warm welcome for all of us today. This meeting is being recorded. All right. Good morning. The honorable keynote speakers, esteemed lecturers, practitioners, students, and all enthusiastic participants and guests. My name is Rio Gasara, and I am a lecturer at the Department of Industrial Engineering, Parayangan Catholic University, or UNPAR. I actually just finished my position as the head of Center for Economics UNPAR three days ago, and Dr. Joanna Rianja is appointed as the new one per 1st July 2021. Because of this transition period, she insists that I'm the one who has to deliver the opening speech. So here I am. Anyway, uh, we are delighted to have you here. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Parahyangan Catholic University Economics Webinar with the theme of Economics in Design. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic that prevents us from meeting physically, we all are grateful for our health and for being able to participate in this important event. Ladies and gentlemen, this economics webinar is one of many programs organized by the Center for Economics UNPAR. And the webinar was initially a guest lecture program exclusive for UNPAR, UNPAR students undertaking the subjects of economics and product economics this semester. However, since we invite international speakers that we are sure they would deliver very interesting topics and new knowledge, we were thinking why don't we make this into a webinar open for public? So uh, other students and many uh, other audience can also experience the benefits. Health is the theme of economics in design. This webinar aims at exploring the application of economics on the design of products and work systems and presenting the state of the art economics in design from international economics experts. We are glad that this morning we have three economic experts who would kindly share their experiences and knowledge with us. First is Professor Ravindra Punatilaka, our old friend, and uh, from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And uh, he was the president of the Hong Kong Economic Society. Second is Professor Alma Maria Jennifer Guterres from the La Salle University, Manila, the Philippines. And she is the president of the Human Factors and Economic Society of the Philippines. And last but not least, Tia Santidewi, PhD. She is a senior lecturer at 10 November Institute of Technology, Surabaya, and also the treasurer of the Indonesian Economic Society. We are certain that all of you would enjoy their great presentation today. Ladies and gentlemen, this economic webinar received great interest from participants of various institutions that many of you join this webinar self to remind us just how important this event is. Based on my notes, we have about 500 people registering, and at the moment, we have about 300 participants joining. 
putting together this webinar, this team effort, I first would like to thank Dr. Johanna Arianja, Mr. Jansen Teofilus, Ms. Clara Teresia, Catherine, Lian Ching, Haneke, and Tasha, who have worked very hard for the success of this webinar. I, in particular, would like to express my sincere gratitude to the keynote speakers who are willing to share their expertise and time for this event. Finally, I would like to thank all participants for taking part in this economics webinar. I hope that you will find this webinar engaging and inspiring, and that the event will provide you with unique opportunity and experience to develop your knowledge and skills in the field of economics. Please enjoy the economics webinar. Thank you very much. And I return the screen to the MC. Thank you, Dr. Deddy Yogasara, for giving us a welcome speech. Now that this webinar officially open, would like to capture today's event by taking a photo. So please turn on your camera. And to our documentation staff, we invite you to lead the photo session. Okay, good morning, everyone. Now I will take screenshot, start from slide one. So one, two, three. Slide two, one, two, three. Slide three, one, two, three. Slide four, one, two, three. Last slide, one, two, three. Okay, thank you, Anika. Thank you, our documentation staff, for leading the photo session. And without any further ado, we will listen to our first speaker, Prof. Ravindra Gunatilake from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He is a professor of the Division of Integrative System and Design and the Department of Industrial Engineering and Decision Analytics at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Joined the HKUST in 1994 and has been in the field of ergonomics in design for over 35 years. Was the human factor manager at Nike Sport Research Lab, senior ergonomics at the Biomechanics Corporation in America, in Long Island, New York. Has over 150 refereed publications in journal and conference proceedings, also eight U.S. patents. Fellow of the International Ergonomics Association, Human Factors and Ergonomics Society USA, and Hong Kong Ergonomics Society. And we are overjoyed to have Prof. Rafi here as one of our speakers for today's webinar. So to Prof. Rafi, we welcome you to deliver the presentation. Thank you, Anika. Can I share my screen? Yes, Professor, of course. I guess everyone can see my screen and hear me, right? Yes? Yes, yes, yes we can. OK. Uh, good morning to everyone. I want to first thank uh, Unpa and also Dr. Teddy and Dr. Johanna for inviting me. Um, I didn't expect to see so many people. I thought there were going to be like 30 people in this. And I see now the count is increasing You know, every second. You know, It's up to like 300. Amazing. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, for me to share uh, some of my experiences in ergonomics in design with all of you here. So um, one thing I would like to request is that uh, uh, even the Zoom classes that I do conduct, uh, I cannot uh, do it without your participation. So I would like you to participate. I have the chat open and I can see what's going on in chat. So please, when I ask a question, please uh, help. Uh, write some answers in chat. Um, there's nothing right or wrong. Um, it's uh, it's uh, where we have some fun and also engaging and, you know, so that I don't put you to sleep, right? Okay, let's uh, get started then. Okay, so uh, for those who 
of you who have not been to Hong Kong, that's what uh, our university looks like. Uh, we are overlooking the water and that's the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, all right, here we go. So uh, I have uh, three images here and I would like you to tell me what is the common theme in all these three? Please help type. What is common in all three? Comfort, comfort, human activities, comfy, comfortable, fashion, cozy, great people, uncomfortable, I like that, chilling. All right, so uh, it's not ergonomic posture. All right, rest. Okay, now, I know some of you said, you know, at the beginning it was all comfortable and comfy, not comfy, and so on. What makes that comfy or not comfy? What is the underlying cause for that? Type, chat, product, design, perception, emotion. Quality. All right, yeah, it's definitely design, no doubt. But uh, let's think about a little more on this, right? Um, now, if you really look at this, all these three images, what you're gonna see is that there is, I lost my screen, sorry. There is some load which is applied on some product. And there is a certain distribution that takes place. So if you look at the extreme left, the person is lying on a bed uh, in the middle, she's wearing high heel shoes. And in the right, she's sitting on a chair. Basically, there is a load that is applied and there is something which is taking up the load somehow. And this is what is causing the comfortable uh, comfort or discomfort, whatever you want to call it. So think about this, right? This is basically how we spend 24 hours of the day, seriously. I mean, of course, there are sometimes, you know, we are, we are kneeling, that's a different story, but most of the time, I would say almost 24, 23 to 24 hours, we are in one of these positions, either standing, sitting down or lying down, which means that you really have to understand how to support load in order to take care of this problem. So, <clears throat> sorry. So these are two things that I work on, which is uh, mainly body support, that is uh, chairs or whatever else and footwear. I don't think I have time to get into footwear. We'll leave that for another time, but I'm gonna focus on chairs because this is one of the biggest problems that we have today. People do not know how to sit. This is what I want to talk about. So uh, it's not just designing ergonomic products, but we need the training to go with that design as well. This is very important to understand. Uh, if you miss that, well, you're going to have problems just like what I'm going to show you today. Now, you know, many of you may have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Abraham Maslow. You know, when he presented that, you know, he had this hierarchy where you go from, you know, the basic physiological up to, you know, uh, very emotional. And even in uh, human factors, we have that. You know, we, you know, everyone works in different areas, physical, safety, errors, fun, comfort, affect, and so on. The, the primary issue here is that, you know, how can you, how can you overcome some of the things at the lowest level. You know, how can you incorporate some of the other things at the high levels? This is what is gonna make ergonomics interesting. And this is what, you know, you need to be thinking of, you know, if you are hoping to get into ergonomics. There is a lot of opportunity that is out there uh, that you can really focus on. So this is from Indonesia itself. I guess some of you can recognize where this is. Yes? You've been there, I guess. Now, I have a question to ask you, which is, 
you know, if you ever gone on this, I haven't, uh, I was going to, um, if you ever gone on this, you're going to ever think about, you know, how you're strapped, the load on your body. Is that what's going to be important or the fun that you're going to have doing this? You know, think about it. So you can see from my previous, this one here, you know, fun, comfort, all these things are going to override some of the issues that we're going to have if it's done right. So we need to be aware of that. It's very important to know that. Now, let me show you what really happens in an office space. This is one of the most uh, elegant offices that I've gone to. And uh, you can see how he's working at his office. Okay, He's sitting down, he's leaning forward, and then looking at whatever he needs to work on. Here's another case. Look at this. How ergonomic are these? But, you know, you look at their furniture. This is state-of-the-art furniture, some of the best furniture that you can you can buy. There's an adjustable workstation, height adjustable. There's a footrest, a very expensive chair. There is a table to hold the um, keyboard. But you still have people working in your in I got muted. I don't know why. Can you hear me now? You can yes, hear me, right? You. Yeah, you can hear you. Sir. Okay. So, um, so this is a major issue. So we can have all these ergonomically designed furniture, but at the same time, you know, if people are not trained, you're going to have, you know, issues in terms of injuries, you know, discomfort, and so on. And we need to know how to take care of this. So let me go into a little bit of biomechanics. I don't want to give you a whole lecture on biomechanics, but I want to tell you a little bit so that you understand what really happens. That's not me who's drawing. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Um, so anyone uh, who's done any kind of biomechanics is going to know that the human spine is like this. Okay. We have five regions, essentially, the cervical spine, the thoracic, which is the upper back, the lumbar spine, which is the lower back. So the main problems come from the lumbar spine and the cervical areas. This is where most of the problem is. And um, what happens in the normal posture, our spine looks like that. But then what happens is that anytime you bend, anytime you're in an awkward posture, I see some of you in these awkward postures. Um, what happens is, you know, there is wedging that is taking place between these vertebra and there is this disc here. I need to get my pointer. Uh, give me a minute, annotate, all right, here we are. Okay, so we have this uh, disc which are in between, like over here, and uh, we get a different uh, annotation here. Okay, so anytime you bend, what's gonna happen is that, you know, you're gonna wedge it, which this desk and there's going to be unnecessary pressure on the on the desk and that's going to cause you discomfort this is the fundamental problem you know with with in terms of sitting now here's what happens someone is bent down like this or you know you uh, most of the time this is the kind of posture that people adopt i walk into offices i see people working like this now, if you're bent down, that's fine. But the problem is with this bending down, people need to lift their neck in order to see the screen. Now, if they're in this kind of posture and, and using a laptop in this kind of orientation where you're looking down, this is fine, no problems. And you'll see a lot of kids today using this kind of posture where you're keeping your laptop down and, uh, and you can see that goes with it because your head is down. But what happens when you have a desktop is that you need to lift your head in order to look at the screen and that's where the problem comes. Then you have compression in the neck area. This is the primary problem that happens. So, so here's the problem. So you can see he is in an awkward posture, bent. 
went. Now, essentially, head should be down there, but you need to look at the screen, which means that your neck is going to be bent upwards, which means that there's going to be wedging taking place, and there's going to be unnecessary disc pressure on the back in the neck area, and also there's going to be problems in the lumbar area. This is the primary problem. Now, how do you, how do you solve this problem? This is where we need to come in. So let me go back to the spine that I talked about. You know, in a normal standing posture, this is the kind of thing that we have, which is a lordosis in the lumbar area. It's kind of curvature going in. But when we are sitting down, what happens is that this area here, which is called the pelvis, rotates. We need to prevent this rotation. The moment it rotates, it takes the spine with it. And then your lumbar area, which is the lower back area, goes outward. And that is what causes the wedging. That causes the wedging. Head is now downward. You need to lift your head up. And now you're going to have wedging in the neck area as well. This is what we need to prevent. How do we prevent this? So you can see the issue here. Okay. He is leaning forward. That's what he has. Why is he leaning forward? Because the pelvis rotated for whatever reason. And now the neck is in a compressed posture right there, okay? It's primarily because the back is arched and the back arched because of this right here. This is what we need to prevent. And this is what, you know, most people don't talk about. So let's see what really happens. Here's your pelvis in the standing position. Here's when you are sitting sitting in a very relaxed position this is what's going to happen this is the area that you know your body is supported right here and this tends to rotate because of the posture that you're sitting in the moment it rotates this spine here is going to move outward and that's what causes the issue so as opposed to that if you were to sit like this, now we are sitting erect, you can see that your spine is in a very neutral posture. So this rotation of your pelvis is something that you really need to prevent. How do we do this? So let me clear these drawings. Now I would like you to observe what really goes on in these two instances, all right? I'm gonna have chat on so that you can, you can write your responses right here. I'm gonna show you uh, this is uh, this is Amy. Uh, we've taught her how to sit down because uh, she's have been having some problems. And I'm going to show you how she's going to sit down in two instances right here. Okay. So please observe what really goes on. This is the first way that she sits. This is the second way. Anyone observe a difference? Let me show you again. Here's a second. Okay, I'm getting some messages here. Matthew. Arch back her posture. Yes, what's what's the difference in her posture? Better posture. Yes. Okay. Pressure on the pelvis. One in the left, she bent her back. Very good. No lumbar curve. Right. Now, look at this again, all right? I will tell you what exactly goes on. In this, on the left side, C spine on the left and almost 90 degrees on the right. Yes. Okay. When she bends, when she sits down, what happens is that, you know, there is some bending that takes place at the hip. And at the same time, the knee is also bending when she's going down to sit. If you observe on the right, she bends down at the hip first. Now she locks her spine in that position right there. How? You bend down and you bend forward with your knee straight. 
And then in that position, you don't open up your hip, but you come down on your knees. Watch it carefully. Okay, she bends down on a, on, at a hip, then comes down on a knee. This is what really prevents this hip rotation or the pelvis rotation. And this is what you really need to observe when you sit down. Most of the time we sit down without even thinking about this. You can see once you sit down, then you can easily arch your back, uh, come back up and your arch and your spinal shape is gonna be maintained. Just observe that. I would like everyone to try this out, you know. Please stand up, bend down, and come down on your knees. Sorry, bend your knees and sit down. Try it out. I want to see how many of you have tried. If you don't try this, you're not going to know what it is, right? Please. I give you two minutes to do it. Is there any culture influence on human posture? Um, I will get to that in a minute. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. So this is what you really need to do. This is all related to training. This is all about, you know, what you know about yourself. Most of the time, you, most people do not know about themselves. Let me ask you another question. Let's see how, about, how many people know about this, okay? Which is longer, your thumb or your pinky? Which one is longer? Think about it. I can see a lot of people looking at their fingers. See? Now the other thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take the other hand and you're gonna put against this one to see which one is longer, right? Okay, keep in mind left and right are not the same. Left and right are could be different. So, you know, if you really don't know, you should check this out. So most of the time we don't know anything about ourselves, even though, you know, you've been having your fingers all along. You, you see this every day, but you know, many of you may not be aware of, you know, which is longer. So, be aware of yourself. This is very important. Now, let me show you some another thing here, which is very important. Okay, which is when you're sitting down, you know, if you're sitting down in a normal chair, what you see here, by the way, is uh, down here um, in this green and uh, blue zone right here down, this is a force plate. So that we can measure the forces acting on the, on the plate from the feet. And so Amy is sitting down here. Uh, in a normal chair, and you can see you have about 100 newtons acting on the force plate, which means, you know, based on her weight, she has about 410 newtons acting on the chair. Okay, in this case, you know, it's 333 newtons acting on the uh, force plate here in an inclined position, which means that uh, there is about, uh, how much is it? 177, I think. 177 newtons acting on her seat. Much lower load, which means the tendency for that pelvis to rotate is gonna be much less because you're putting less force on it, right? So this is why a lot of people today are adopting this kind of sit-stand posture for the simple reason that, you know, you can have more weight on your feet and then less on your, on your buttocks. And of course, depending on the inclination that you have, you can, uh, you can load each one differently. Whereas if you're sitting down like this, you're pretty much stuck. And especially if you are sitting on a very soft surface, you cannot really move. And that's why soft surfaces become very uncomfortable over longer periods of time. Now, let me show you some of the some of these studies that we've done so that you have some idea of, you know, what really happens because someone asked me, okay, are there any differences in, in terms of culture? So we've looked at, uh, so you can see essentially everything depends on the spinal curvature and how it changes, you know, when you are sitting down. So the amount that it changes tells us a lot about the pressure that you have on the back. Now, here's a study that we did which is uh, looking at the seat angle and also looking at the change of shape of the spine. So what we did was put marks on the spine, just like what you see, we palpate, look at where the vertebra and place the uh, marks on that. And then we can change the angle on the seating surface by changing this position here. And uh, what did we find? 
there are two populations. One is the Indian population and the other one is uh, the Hong Kong population. And you can see how these final shape changes. Now, the standing one is the... the things are overlapping right here. Um, can you see my pointer? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, Professor. Okay, so standing is right here, which is a solid line. And then you can see the standing posture, what the curvature is, okay, uh, in a standing posture for, uh, the, there are 10 people here, 10 Hong Kong Chinese and 10 Indians. And you can see what the um, standing posture is. And then for each one of the angles, which is a trunk thigh angle, which is basically the angle of the chair, you can see what the postures are. Now, a lot of people, what they have said is that as you increase your trunk thigh angle or increase the sitting angle, what happens is that the spinal shape comes back to its normal shape. But we don't see that. It really doesn't. Of course, it moves towards the standing posture, but there is still a difference. So you need, they need, there has to be some compensation on your pelvis if you are to get close to this. But if you look at one of the subjects, this is a, this subject right here is the only one Okay, who gets anywhere close to the standing posture. Everyone else is far away. What does this mean? We still don't know how to say it. That's basically what it is. So this is very important for you to understand. You can have very ergonomic furniture, but training of people is as important as sitting down. As you saw, you, I, saw I showed you a very expensive workplace, but still there are issues. There are uh, problems that people face. There's discomfort, there's pain, there's injury, and so on. So, and you can see this in this uh, figure right here. So, oops. so recline backrest, yes, it gets back some of the spinal curvature, which means that the disc pressure is reduced. By the way, we cannot do any disc pressure studies right now. You know, uh, most of these disc pressure studies were done in the 70s and the 80s. But today it's unethical to look at this pressure. So all we can do is look at the shape of the spine rather than, you know, uh, inject and check out what the pressure is. So you can see reclined backrest, which is increasing the, uh, increasing the angle of the backrest, will try to restore some of the lumbar shape. And as a result, your disc pressure can be low. A uh, second way to do this is by using a lumbar support. I don't believe this really works very well, but you know, people do believe in it. Uh, you'll see that people putting cushions like that into the lower back area to give it support. But you know, it's almost impossible to push your lumbar area back into its original shape if your pelvis has rotated, because that's going to be a much powerful force rather than the back that you have in there. Okay. So there are various devices. You have inflatable devices which you can move up and down, which you can increase so that you can push your lumbar area. Um, so that's another possibility. But uh, uh, one that I really like is what's called the forward tilting chair. Yeah. Now, look at this. Let me get my chat on again. Uh, so what's common in all these three images? What is common here? Yeah, three images here. What is common? Great low back posture, knee position, folded legs, straight back, leg position. Very good. Leg position. All right. So position of the legs. Okay. You can see the position of the legs is pretty much the same. In other words, what has really happened? How many of you have sat like this? You know, when you are in, you know, primary school or high school, how many of you did this? All the time, very good. Why did people do this? I still remember, you know, when I was in, when I was in uh, uh, middle school and high school, I used to sit like this and my father used to always come and tell me, Ravi, there are four, four legs to that chair, put all four legs down. But, you know, in this kind of posture, you are very comfortable. Why? Why are you so comfortable? Anyone? The knee bent. Yes, the knee is bent in all of them, right? If you're sitting down at the normal chair as well, 
your knee is bent as well. But one thing that you observe is that you, your angle here is going to be more than 90 degrees. That's basically what you have right here. Now, what does that mean? Means the chance of your pelvis rotating is going to be much lower because your pelvis will start rotating only after about 90 degrees. Uh, sorry, only after about 120 degrees. When your thigh uh, hip thigh angle or trunk thigh angle goes less than 120 degrees, that's about when your spine is going to start rotating. So if you're in this kind of posture where you have this uh, knee sloping down or thigh sloping downwards with, with an upper back, what happens is that your angle, the trunk thigh angle is about 120 degrees. Very nice posture, pelvis in its uh, position as if you were standing and your spine does not change and you're very comfortable. You can keep an upright posture. So this is really the, the downward sloping seat pan is one of the best postures that you can adopt. Now there is another uh, chair just like this, but one, it has a knee support right here. The problem with that is that when you have that knee support, they kind of put a lot of pressure on the knees and that's going to become uncomfortable. But if there is a, if you have a means of just tilting the seat back and forth, you can be in a very, very comfortable position. So this is where you really use ergonomics in order to design what you really need to design. You need to understand the biomechanics. You need to understand um, how the body works and also you need to be trained in order to know how to sit. So when you're talking about sitting, there are three important considerations. Back muscle activity, and a lot of people have shown that back muscle activity, when your trunk thigh angle is about 120 degrees is the lowest your back muscle activity. The disc pressure, as I showed you, is going to be low around that time. And then the other thing that you need to worry about is what's called the seat interface pressure. So let me talk about seat interface pressure. Now, this is basically a seat uh, pressure map a seat pressure map, what you see here, this is a seat pressure map. When a person is sitting down, some, you know, most of the time you're gonna see symmetry, but sometimes, you know, there may not be any symmetry. The red regions are basically high pressure. The blue regions are the low pressures. And uh, so if you look at the pressure values, that's basically how you're gonna see what you're gonna see if you take a section across like that. So it's low and then comes to high, which is where your buttock support is, which is what's called ischial tuberosities. And that's the highest pressure, which is the red region right there, goes down again, comes up again, and so on. Now, one thing that happens is sometimes you're gonna see people with a cross leg. They cross one over the other. Why do, why do people do that? Anyone has any idea? Please? Type on chat. Anyone has any idea why people cross their legs? Comfy. Feel comfy. Let's go a little bit beyond comfy. Lean, style, to distribute the load, cultural, norm, habit, shift their weight. Shift their weight. I like that. Yes, it's. Um, less pressure. Think about this, you know, see, this is another important thing. We do a lot of things, but you know, we don't really pay attention to why we do it. Your body has its natural way of doing, taking care of the problems that do happen. And again, you know, when it's a small kid, they do things that we don't understand and we try to prevent them from doing it. But that's basically their defensive mechanism. You need to understand that. Um, so the reason that most people cross their leg is, yeah, it could be habit, could be culture and all those things. But one problem, one thing is that you want to shift your weight to a different side, you know, whether it be left or right. And at the same time, there's one more thing which is important. Most of the time, even in your standing posture, your pelvis may not be in a balanced position. By crossing your legs, you are moving your pelvis 
and getting that into a balanced position. That's basically what you're really doing. And that's why most of the time people are, are comfortable in a cross leg position because of that. Yes, you, of course, minimize space and so on. All these do happen, but it's a combination of shifting weight, which is the interface pressure. At the same time, you rotated your pelvis, which means you're minimizing your disc pressure and got your spinal shape back. You know, So it's a really a combination of all three of these things. So keep in mind, when you're sitting, there's muscle activity, there's disc pressure. And the third one is interface, interface pressure. And you're trying to find the optimum for these three things. That's not easy to do. Okay, And each one has their different threshold, which you need to optimize in order to get a very good sitting position. This is why there is really nothing very solid stated in terms of sitting, because it is difficult to do, because it's an optimization problem. Those who are in operations research you know this is a very good optimization problem to solve. So that's really what happens. Now, let me move on here. Oopsie. Okay. So let me show you a few more things here. What really happens as you go from as you go from um, a flat surface to an inclined surface. And also, I am including a lot of things here because of uh, the limitation of time, but uh, please bear with me, okay? So seat height is also important. You need to have the right seat height. Now, she's sitting at 54 cm here, zero degrees on the, on the seat surface. This one is 44 cm at uh, zero degrees. Look at the pressure profiles. What you're gonna see is that, okay, in, um, Spotlight. Okay. In here, oops, sorry. Um, in here, you can see a lot of pressure in the thigh region right here. This is not very good. This is going to compress your nerves. Okay. After a while, you're going to have pain and also discomfort right there. Yeah, why? Because of the, um, the seat height. Seat is too high. Now, in this kind of position, we are 44 cm, zero degrees, fairly good. You can see you still have a lot of high pressures, but you don't have the tight compression right there. Okay. Again, um, let me uh, go back to my scale. So the red regions are essentially the high pressures. The blues are the low pressures right there. Okay, That's basically the scale. The pressure increases from here to here, and this is in kilopascal. Now, let me go to the next one here. I'm going to increase the angle. Now I have gone to 10 degrees and you can see how the pressures have changed. Now the thigh pressure that you had before is very reduced. So you can see by changing the angle, even though it's as high as seat height, okay, a person can be, can adjust to that. Okay. People do adjust very quickly. Now, in this case with 10 degrees, what has happened is most of the pressure has gone to the ischial tuberosities, which means the tendency for the pelvis is gonna, uh, pelvis to rotate is gonna be higher. You need to be aware of that. Oops, sorry. And here's the last one, which is same height, 20, 20 degrees. And you can see now this one here, these, uh, the thigh pressure is beginning to increase, which is not very good. But somewhere in between 10 and 20 degrees, which is essentially like 15 degrees, would be ideal for this seat height. So these are things that, you know, really how you apply ergonomics into design so that you can design your furniture based on these aspects right here. Now, how much time do I have? Anyone? Uh, what time am I supposed to finish? 10.48. Okay, let, I, I think I should be able to finish. So now, um, these days you cannot fly in airplanes uh, or it's becoming difficult. But uh, there was a time that, you know, people were, you know, flying a lot. And uh, one of the most uncomfortable um, places that you can be in is an, inside an aircraft, okay, sitting on a very long flight, you know, there'll be 15 hour flight. Why? There is a primary reason for this. The 
airplane seats are not catered to this kind of long distance flying. This is a, a serious problem. So you can see some people would take, you know, someone else's seat at the same time because, you know, he or she is not very really happy with the space that you have. Okay, limited space. I think uh, someone commented earlier on, you know, the limited space that you had. But here's the primary problem. If you look at the aircraft seat information, um, what you're going to see is one of the primary things, one of the most important things is this thing called seat depth. This is how deep your seat is. It's not, it's not the um, compression. It's basically from your knee to the back of the seat, how much space you have. And if you look at that, that really depends on what, what the airline you're flying on. And the lowest is Singapore Airlines. And they are the ones who are really catering to this because, you know, people in this region tend to be a little shorter than the Westerners. As a result, this one here has to be shorter. This is application of ergonomics in design. And you have to be aware of this. And we've done a lot of studies, which I'll show you now, uh, as to what really happens when this seat depth is too long. So this seat depth here varies from airplane to airplane. The next time you are flying on something, okay, measure that seat, de seat depth. And you'll know how what it is relative to some of this information that I've shown you. Now, here's what we've done. We've looked at, you know, test, we made test chairs. By the way, this is made of rattan. Uh, rattan, the highest producer of rattan is Indonesia, by the way. Uh, this were, I got these made in Sri Lanka. So this is a special chair that I designed and developed here. So we have these pieces, which are, you know, each of these pieces is a, is a width of, 7.6 centimeters, and you can kind of put them together and you get a chair like this. Um, you get a chair like this, like this one here. So we can take off any one of these units and you can have a different, different, uh, different depth. And what we found is with this experiment, what we found is that 30 cm is like the best seed depth that you can use, anything beyond that is going to cause a problem because either it's going to be too long or people are going to start putting cushions in the back or your pelvis is going to rotate. You're going to get a hump back and all these things. Okay. All these problems are going to happen. Primary seat depth. This is your foundation. You know, a lot of people are working on backrest, but backrest is not the issue. What you need to really work on is a seat, depth, seat pan. You know, it's like a building. You know, you have a foundation. You can work on your glass and structures up there, but if your foundation is weak, everything is going to collapse. That's basically what a chair is. It's a foundation that matters, which means it's a seat pan that matters rather than the backrest. Backrest is important. I'm not saying it's not important, but pay attention to your seat pan before you go there. Now, how I showed you cases of where you had an ideal office, you had some of the most expensive furniture you can buy, but people are still not sitting right. Now, how can we, five more minutes, okay, all right. Uh, how can we take care of this problem? Here's how I want to illustrate this issue, okay? Um, look at this. Now, if I have a square peg going into a square hole, I can, I can assemble this any way I want, right? Now, in this case, it doesn't really matter, but let me think, say that, okay, I'm going to put the UNPA logo on it. Now, if you don't assemble it right, I'm going to have a problem. Okay, it's going to be upside down, it's, you know, depending on how you look at it. This is a problem. So when you're designing furniture, it's not just a case of designing with the features there. You need to make sure that you design it in such a way that, you know, it's going to be fail safe or foolproof, that there is only one way to design. And uh, this is what, you know, this is what this design is all about. So I talked about minimizing the seat depth so that, uh, you're sitting in, you know, the right, right place and also at the right angle. So this is a, a chair designed by Miroslav Truban, exactly what we've been talking about. You need to have the right hip thigh angle or trunk thigh angle and also sit on a smaller area so that you don't rotate your pelvis. How do you do that? By having, you know, sitting like that. You can see what your trunk thigh angle is and also small area for seat depth chances of you rotating your pelvis is going to be much lower as a result. So 
these are the things that we need to build in. You know, we can have all the data, but how do we incorporate into a design? That's what we need to really think about. You know, the next step, which is incorporating that into the design part. So here are three chairs that I have in my office. Anyone want to take a guess as to which one I like most, A, B, C? A, A, B, A. Uh -huh. Okay, so basically most of you have seemed to have got it, okay? B is a very expensive chair. This is a steel case leap chair. It has a, it has a, a um, it has almost every feature that you can have, okay? You can have adjustable back, adjustable, a uh, lot of things. But A, you can see the seat depth is minimal. And also one of the features of this is that, you know, your legs can go here and you can get this ideal trunk thigh angle so that, you know, you have 120 degrees or whatever it is, depending on how you sit. And you can keep a fairly erect posture, even though, this is a fairly hard surface. You being uncomfortable in this kind of chair is going to be way less than you know, being uncomfortable in this one or this one. Okay. Soft chairs will distribute pressure, but the problem is that you know, after a while, you're going to sink into it and your pelvis is going to rotate. Whereas here, you're putting some of the load, as I showed you before, some of the load on the feet. So you can really control the amount of load that you have on your feet and your back so that you know you can you can go into this kind of posture. Okay, I'm almost out of time. All right, let me let me. Um, I think uh, okay. So uh, another important thing is you know in terms of controls, if you're having a lot of controls, make sure that your controls are things that people can adjust. We have a lot of controls for different things in different chairs, but. The problem is that people don't change them once you adjusted it the first time around. This is why we developed what's called an intelligent seat. Uh, anyone interested in it can look at this patent. I will not go through it. Uh, it has 17 controls, as you saw here. It has 17 controls, 17 places that are inflatable, and the pressure will adjust. It's automatically controlled. And uh, these 17 are. Uh, the same things that uh, the uh, Porsche Macan GT that came out about two years ago, they have 17 controls, but the difference is that they're still in manual mode. It's not intelligent. That's gonna take a long time. By the way, that pattern that I showed you was over 20 years ago, but still it's not come into play, okay? So it's so far ahead in 1990s, but this is again something that happens. You know, I want to tell you, be patient. Sometimes you may have a very good invention, but you know, um, things do take time. And, uh, and uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there's nothing much you can do. All right. Okay, I am uh, basically done. Uh, anyone who wants to uh, know more about ergonomics and design, I would like you to um, look at this edX course we just started. You can see it started July 1st and I'm gonna put a trailer for that and uh, I will stop right there. Sorry about going over if I am over. Oh my goodness. What is that? Robots everywhere. Steps. Hope it can't climb as it seems metal unlike me. It's climbing. I need to find something to deactivate this. Can I see what is it? What is it? Where well, I go? See the right size. With this rod trick my hands from me to exert my full strength. It's me against this robot now. I need to deactivate this. Is it iron bar the right size for me to use? Does my hand fit in size? Will it allow me to use my maximum strength? To answer this question, you need the science of ergonomics. I think many of you may have heard of ergonomics, but the question is, do you know how it applies to your day-to-day -day life? And also, how can you use it so that you can be effective and also efficient? Ergonomics is not just related to a chair or the remote control you use. It's related to almost every product that you use. Ergonomics is all about the interaction between people and products and systems that they use so that they are safe, convenient, comfortable, and most importantly, effective and efficient. We think people are flexible and they can use anything. But when a product is not designed well, it becomes difficult, cumbersome, inconvenient, and even frustrating. I hope I got your interest on this science of economics. 
to learn more, I advise you to check this course that is in two parts. Part one is all about ergonomics in design and part two is ergonomics in action. Ergonomics in design will introduce you to the basic principles for the creation of products and services that are safer, healthier and more efficient and effective to you. It will also allow you to have a good understanding of how the human body allows movement. Ergonomics in action, on the other hand, will help you to design a workplace according to ergonomic principles considering anthropometry. This course will help you discover the various problems that may exist in different situations and also help you identify engineering solutions the next time you use a product. Join us in exploring anthropometry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rafi, for the extensive explanation about ergonomics in design and a lot about our sitting position and the impact of to our spine. And now we'll begin the first Q&A session. If you have some question to ask, please write I want to ask in the chat section. And I will call you to ask your question by turning on your microphone. Or you can also write down your question at the chat section. I just posted the link to that course. If anyone is interested, you're most welcome to um, join. It's free of charge, by the way. Unless you want a certificate, in which case you have to pay something where that is. Okay, Prof. Rafi, seems like there's a participants want to ask to Faza. Please turn on your microphone. Please go ahead and ask. What's up, I want to ask you about chiropractic therapy. Does the chiropractic direct you to correct our spine posture? Is body cracking good for health? Um, <laughs> okay, uh, I want to first tell you I'm not a medical professional, but uh, but one thing chiropractic a chiropractor does is basically set your bones back in place. Okay, you can think of it as bone setting. Now, a lot of times what has happened is that, you know, if you are in very awkward postures, what will happen is that, you know, you're sitting in the same kind of posture. Then what will happen is that your muscles, you know, go into a spasm or go into a knot, you'll have a muscle knot, which means you lock a certain part of your spine or your body. Now, this is something that you need to get rid of. The reason it locks is because there could be, you know, some damage to some part of the body. And as a result, your muscle is locking. Your brain tells you to lock that part so that, you know, you prevent any other damage. So what the chiropractor does is relieves that. Even uh, physiotherapy basically gets rid of the muscle knot or the muscle spasm that you have so that your joint can work normally as it should, which in this case is fine. So most of the time, if you are sitting in a static posture, holding your muscle, okay, the muscle is going to spasm and go into a locking position. So that's why we always say, okay, don't have postural fixity. Don't fix your posture, you know, in, in one position. You need to move in order to get rid of this problem that you have. So chiropractor or physiotherapy does help to relieve these muscle spasms or knots and to get back the original configuration of your, of your, of your bones. So that's where it helps. Body cracking is basically uh, getting the spine or whatever joint back into its alignment. That's what it is. Okay. So um, I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, that's something that you can do uh, so that, you know, always make sure that you align your posture. So sometimes, you know, when I'm in an awkward posture, you know, I really feel some discomfort. What happens is that, you know, I will align and, you know, I can feel it cracking. Cracking is basically getting back its original shape. That's basically what it is. Your research has a paradigm shift. Previous study suggests you have a cushion for the chair as well as seat depth to make the user more comfortable. Yes, it is absolutely right. Oh yeah, it's a direct message. <laughs> okay, I want to ask, okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Professor, for the previous answer to the question that Faza has asked before. And now we also have from Gabrielle Kathleen's question. 
is about where does ergonomic training take place? It is upon hire and will it have to be handled in a similar fashion or hazard communication? The question is have been sent at 10 a.m. So it was previous to the FAZA's question. Uh, at 10 a.m. It's on, it's on chat? Yes, it is on chat already. At 10 a.m. Let me go back. It is above of the link that you have sent before. Oh, just above? Above the link that you have sent before. Oh, 10 a.m. Uh, Indonesian time, right? Sorry, sorry. Yes. I was looking at uh, <laughs> okay, where does ergonomic training tra okay, found it. Where does ergonomic training take place? Is it upon hire and would it have to be handled in a similar fashion to hazard communication? Okay, so uh, I do, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, this is a job of ergonomics in different places. A lot of uh, multinational companies do have ergonomics uh, trainers who go into their workplace to train people how to do basic things like sit down, how to do whatever they need to do and so on. So, um, so yes, uh, there are consultants uh, in different places, different countries that do provide this kind of service. Uh, it is upon hire, yes, unless, you know, you can find some... Um, some uh, free training course to do this. And would it be handled in a similar fashion to hazard communication? Yes. In fact, this is a hazard in the office. Uh, people don't realize it, you know. And uh, a lot of employers think that, you know, you have, uh, you buy good furniture and this problem is going to go away. The problem does not go away because unless you are training your people, they're not going to know how to sit, how to work. So this is a combination of, you know, equipment, people, Training, design, everything comes into play. And if you if you don't do this right, you know your puzzle is not going to fit right, and that's where you know people are going to have problems. So that's what you know. Uh, some of the consultancy work that I've done, uh, this is what the employers tell me: it's like we bought them the most expensive furniture, but the problems have not gone away. The problems still exist. Why? Reason is simple: is because you know there has not been no training to go with. The, the, the furniture that they have, and also some of the furniture is not designed so that they are foolproof. So people sit any way they want. So that's not gonna, you know, that's not gonna be the right interaction between the human body and whatever they are gonna use. That's basically the issue. How designer work these days? Use the economic calculation first and design the shape First, ergonomic, oops, oops, it's moving fast. Uh, use the ergonomic calculation first and design the shape first, ergonomic later. Uh, yes, you can design the shape and ergonomics later. You can do that. But if things fall into place, you're great. But if it doesn't, then you have a problem, okay? People um, may buy the furniture just for its form factor, but you know, some of the, um, Officers, I mean, they they know what is ergonomic and so on because they have a lot of consultants who tell them, you know, whether a chair or workstation is ergonomic or not. So uh, very soon people are going to find out what's ergonomic and what's not ergonomic. So you have to make sure that you do cater to the people and the ergonomic aspects. How do we improve correct our seating position with offered chairs that has longer depth without replacing the chair? <laughs> that's that, that's a very good question. Okay. This longer depth is a serious problem, okay? Um, one thing that you can do is, you know, put a few of those cushions in the back that basically reduces the seat depth. Most of the time, people put this seat cushion not to get lumbar support because it doesn't give lumbar support. Most of it is very, very soft. All it's doing is you're not going all the way to the back when you're sitting down. But you know, if you use a very soft cushion, that doesn't support it. So if you want to do that, put something which is fairly hard in the back with some shape um, so that you can effectively reduce the seat depth. You cannot reduce the seat depth, but you put something so that effectively re reduce the seat depth. Would you, uh, would you mind to tell us what kind of tools and our software that you use for such study analysis? More detail will be much appreciated. Thanks. Okay, um, so uh, in terms of tools, um, 
I use uh, a lot in terms of uh, my tools in terms of, you know, the uh, office ergonomics or evaluations. You cannot do too much because, you know, there are people working. So most of the time, the tools I use is essentially my phone, which is taking photographs and looking at, you know, their postures. What kind of postures have they adopted? What is really the issue? Okay. So using a phone, using, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> using a phone, Okay, can give you a lot of information in terms of the postures that are adopted. So, for example, you know, the, the poking chin posture, which I'll show you, okay, this is, this is what I am, okay, you can see my chin is fairly flat, but what happens is people go into this kind of posture. This is the problem. Why? Because once your spine is bent, you know, you have to look up in order to look at the screen because that's the only way you can see the screen. So, when you have those kinds of postures, you know exactly what's going on, okay? Pelvis is rotated, hump back, <clears throat> then chin up, then you have back problems, you have, you know, neck problems, you have uh, low back problems, all these problems are gonna arise. So outside, in a place, I use uh, just, a, just a, a camera or a phone, but if I go to a workplace, then I take a lot of tools with me, you know, it can be, uh, depending on what we need to really evaluate. We um, mainly do postural analysis, also do some strength analysis to see what kind of strength we have. Then anthropometric analysis, all these are things that uh, we will do. Is the Kerbal chair available in the market help? Oh, uh, oh I sk skipped a question. Okay. Um, okay. Is a Kerbal chair? Is that is that the the gym bar, the gym ball that you're talking about, Jennifer? What is the Kerbal chair? I don't know what is a Kerbal chair. Uh, is is the chair that you that you put on a ergonomic chair to support the spine? Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Uh, this is uh, basically for the for the uh, for the back or for the seat pan. It's uh, it's for the back and the seat pan. Together. Yes, together. Um, okay, I need to look at that. I'll 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 let you do it. I don't know what this Kerbal chair is doing. Uh, prompted by a design project for working on a height adjustable product, I'm wondering whether there have been any studies on ergonomic aspects of couples, such as height difference between partners. from students working on a height adjustable product, I'm wondering whether there have been any studies into ergonomic aspects of couples, such as height differences between partners, male and female. I am not aware of any, any such study. Um, looking at, uh, that's a good question. Basically, uh, I guess, I'm not sure exactly what your question is, but I guess you're in one place and you wanna have a male and a female or a couple is essentially used use that device, correct? Is that what you mean? So you wanna see whether they match each other. Uh, yes, okay. So, um, yeah, so essentially it's not a completely adjustable, but uh, I, I am not aware of any such uh, study, by the way, uh, to, answer, to keep the answer short, but um, that's a very good thing to look at really. What is the mismatch? When you have, you know, one workstation that people are sharing today, especially, you know, people are working from home. So, you know, it could be, it could be uh, a mother, father or child who's using the workstation. How can you adjust that to fit or suit everyone? Um, it's, I think it's a good, very good research uh, problem to work on. Uh, I don't know any study that has done that. Anything else? Okay, I'm looking at. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, 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 okay. Um, Maybe this is the last question, Professor. So sure. I would like to invite Gianluca Gerson to turn on your camera and microphone to ask directly to Professor Rafi. Uh, just uh, I, I just took a quick look at the coverage here. Right, Jennifer. Uh, basically, what that's doing is essentially 
preventing the pelvis from rotating. That's basically what it is. It has like half a, a seat pan support. So this is at the back of the chair. Essentially, this is how you can prevent this pelvis rotation. That's exactly what it's doing. So it doesn't allow it to shift completely. So there is some backrest, but the most of it is essentially on the seat pan where it's preventing these, uh, the pelvis from rotating. So this is effective? The yes. Yes. Okay. yes, thank you. Correct. Um, uh, who had the question? Sorry. Uh, sorry, I was logged out suddenly. Can't unmute myself. Uh, uh, can you hear me, Professor? Yes, I can. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, talking about ergonomics, I got reminded of a video I saw a few years ago about um, man spreading. It's where males typically sit with their legs wide apart. Is there an ergonomic reason towards that, or is it just is it uh, beneficial for males to sit? Is it more comfortable for us to sit with our legs apart, or is it just um, social? Um, okay, now, uh, I think there are two parts to your question. One is, uh, you know, when you sit like that, generally you're sitting on a floor, correct? Or you're sitting on a surface, on a uh, chair, but it's not usually. really a chair as such. Like on a public transport and stuff like that. Oh, I see, public transport. Okay, so um, um, I think it's mainly a social thing. That's one of the reasons I think uh, ladies tend to also cross their legs, you know, as is the uh, opposite of exactly that. Um, are you asking the biomechanics part or are you asking a, uh, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, um, um, is there any ergonomic uh, benefit? I mean, is it like uh, sitting with our legs crossed and everything like that, or is it just... So the legs crossed essentially is, as I said, most of the time is uh, to shift your weight onto one side. You know, sometimes they cross right over left, sometimes left over right. Okay. So that allows to cross, uh, sorry, uh, to shift the pressure, to shift the load and also change the pressure on one part of the body. Sometimes, you know, one part may be too sensitive for whatever reason. You know, you may have, for example, a, a, a wallet in your pocket, back pocket. So that may put some high pressure there and you may want to relieve that. So you may cross the leg that way. Okay. So that's one possibility of why people cross their legs. The second reason, okay, the more important reason is that it brings your pelvis back into balance. You know, when your pelvis is in an unbalanced position, the reason the pelvis becomes in an unbalanced position is because of a muscle imbalance. Okay. You have your abdominal muscles, your glute muscles, your hip hip extensors, hip flexors, okay, and your back extensors. When there is imbalance in these, that's when your pelvis rotates. When your pelvis is rotated, changes the spine, changes the orientation of the spine. When that happens, that's when you have discomfort. That's why people start fidgeting, okay, because you can't stay in that position because you have some pain, so you start moving around. Now, why do people have their legs apart? I think it's just a case of... Uh, um, a little bit of freedom, I guess. Um, yeah, I cannot think of any biomechanical reason why as to why people will have their legs apart. But crossing is there is a biomechanical reason for that, you know, in terms of shifting the weight and so on. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Okay, thank you for all of the participants for the enthusiasm on this Q&A session. And we have heard a lot from Professor Rafi that there are lots that should be supported during an activity and which can cause a comfort in a product. Issues in comfort and injuries happened to our spinal disc and can cause discomfort and compression to the spine. One example is about how we sit. Most of the time, we don't really pay attention to how we sit and we also basically don't know how to sit properly. And there are three sitting considerations. It is about back muscle activity, disc pressure, and seat interface pressure. And we need to optimize three things that Professor Rafi has told us in terms to find the best posture in sitting. Crossing legs is often be done, so we could distribute or shift our pressure for a certain part of, body, of the body and balancing the pelvis position. And the last note is that 
Remember, not only ergonomics in design, but we also need to care about ergonomics in action. Thank you, Professor, Professor Rafi, for telling us the most notable issue that we often not aware about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Rafi. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Rafi. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you, Prof. Rafi. Thank, Thank you, Joanna. And now Thank we'll you. have a break for three minutes. But before we take a break from the first session of today's webinar, please make sure that you're not leaving the Zoom meeting. But you may turn off your camera and enjoy your break time. around your body laughing but the joke's not funny at all and it took you five four minutes back us up and leave me with you holding all this love out here in the wall i think i've seen this film before and I didn't love the ending You're not my homeland anymore So what am I defending now? You are my town Now I'm in the next I've seen you out I've seen this film before Staring, honey, like it's just your understudy. Like you'd get your knuckles bloody for me. Second, third, and hundredth chances, balancing on breaking bridges. Those eyes add insult to injury. Okay, hello everyone. I invite 
all of you to come back and stand by in front of your laptop or your PC because I'm sure we all not cannot wait any longer to hear the presentation from Professor Alma Maria Jennifer Gutierrez. She is a full professor of the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department at the La Salle University and also an Asian engineer. She is also the president of the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society in the Philippines, Southeast Asian Network of Ergonomic Societies Educator Award 2018 in Bangkok, Thailand. She also has publications in the International Journal of Industrial Ergonomics. And lastly, she is engaged in ergonomics consultancy on safety productivity enhancement through ergonomics development program to the government and private sector. So without any further ado, to Professor Jennifer, the time is yours. Professor Jennifer, it's still muted. Okay. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. So thank you for inviting me for this uh, ergonomics in design. Can you now see my screen? Not yet. Still in the process. Okay. Can you see my yeah. screen now? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, thank you very much. So my presentation is the redesign of the form and label of waste bin in De La Salle University. So this paper was made by my advisees, Ms. Princess Camille Fajardo and Ms. Julian Ruiz Poniente. So throwing trash can be cumbersome. Waste segregation is included in law because it is much easier to recycle. Effective segregation of waste means that less waste goes to landfill, which makes it cheaper and better for the people and the environment. So how can we encourage people to segregate their waste? So the Waste Analysis and Characterization Study Report, or WACS, conducted by De La Salle University's Campus Sustainability Office, or CSO, revealed that the university contributes 8,000 tons of waste in Metro Manila daily. Majority of waste collected was inaccurately separated into its corresponding category. The biodegradable, which is the green one, the non-biodegradable, the black one, and the recyclable waste for intermix, as can be seen from this picture. As a consequence, it becomes more difficult to utilize the resources that may be recovered with the collected garbage. CSO, despite that their initiatives to make sorting waste easier, the majority of trash still remain unsegregated. CSO also mentioned that this may be due to lack of awareness, ignorance, or lack of concern regarding mixed waste. So these are some of the questions that we ask. Are they attempting to sort? Where are they sorting? What are they sorting? How do they use the waste bin? How do they throw their trash? Are they in a rush? So we've conducted a naturalistic observation in order to reduce the Hawthorne effect and provide a deeper insight about the behavior of the users. Given this, 175 observations were made on the DLSU community on how they threw their trash in the waste bin, as you can see here on the figure. So we made sure that there is a distance between the different trash bin and the observation. This table shows the proportion of waste thrown per category and the percent contribution of each category of waste to the total waste sorting uh, of the DLSU community. The result shows that more than half of the items were not properly sorted, 
as can be seen from the non-biodegradable, which accounts for 58.72%. More than half of the non-biodegradable waste were incorrectly sorted. Despite the interventions conducted by CSO, a 62.29% sorting error still exists. In order to gain a better insight on why these bins were designed the way they are, it is important to identify and name the attributes that will be studied and modified during the redesign of the bin. Based on the evaluation of the current waste bin in DLSU, the waste bin has eight attributes. The body shape, the opening shape, the opening lid, or sorry, opening position, lid, label signages design, label signages position, categories, and color. The part name and description of the areas indicated in the figure are also presented in this table. So this is the head height, the top head, the lead area, the attached lead side position, the lead end distance, the front head area, the body height, the bo uh, uh, front body area, the body width, and the body depth. So aside from the naturalistic observation, we also conducted a focus group discussion. We want to know the main reason is to de determine their needs as well. The focus group was conducted in order to obtain information on the difficulties in waste sorting experience by the DLSU community. The group was composed of eight people, which is, consists of one staff and seven students from the different colleges. So the, the purpose of this is to be able to represent the different population in the university. So these are some of their statements based on the focus group discussion. It's hard to throw my trash in the bin that I want to because it's already full. It's hard to separate my food waste. It's hard to throw my trash because of the flat. And majority find it difficult to use. Aside from the naturalistic observation and also the FGD, we also conducted an online survey and we used the results of the FGD in asking questions for the online survey. A total of 81 responded uh, for this survey and the population is shown, population age, as well as their sorting intention. So as you can see, they have the intention to sort, but there's still a problem in sorting. So we also conducted a Pareto analysis on the main problem identified. Based on the Pareto, difficult to use is the number one reason, followed by lack of knowledge, inconvenient, confusing and distracting, and unhygienic. So the we also, the result of the survey as well as the FGD, based on that one, we have come up with the house of quality. The first house of quality was used in order to deliberate the customer attributes with the technical requirements of the product. It is also called the planning matrix as the initial HQ was to interpret consumers' desire into substantial product characteristics. From this house of quality, it is important to understand the technical attributes that will be obtained. The user needs were translated using the descriptions from the users. The top three attributes according to HOQ1 were similarity of actual items thrown, size of label, and number of text label. So despite of the policy, behavioral, and technical intervention conducted by CSO, a 62.29% sorting mistake still exists. So we've also conducted a related 
uh, review of literature. And these are some of the authors that we have found. Keramit Soglu and Sagarakis, 2018, discuss how design variables such as shape, insert slot, and color of a recycling bin can affect the recycling behavior of the public. Their study showed that rectangular bins gained most attention and were said to be most attractive. Also, their results showed that rectangular bins were preferred most by the public. There also, uh, their study indicated that people tend to identify and associate the color of the bin with the color of the material thrown. Example, paper is associated with white, gray colors and organic material are associated with green or brown colors. It was also found out that when two bins of the same size and shape, using different colors for the bin, will help the user differentiate the bins. This was also proven by the study of Boyce Clear in 2010. The study of Jiang et al. Uh, conducted a study on the circular slot for bottle versus the same, same shape of the bottle. Later on, I'll show you that one. On the other hand, the, st the study of Olafson 2016 and Wu et al. 2018 studied the importance of icons on pictures on the label. The study of Jiang et al. 2019 designed and investigated 10 recycling bins for PET bottles. The focus of their study was to determine the effect of design on cap removal, as you can see here, uh, so that it will be more efficient in recycling uh, and avoid recycling contamination. The results of their study indicated that insert slots with round shape significantly contributed in lowering recycling contamination compared to the bottle-like shape, as shown here. It was also inferred that the circular insert slot is more effective due to past experiences, since people were used to circular openings for bottles, so they notice it faster compared to the bottle-like shape. And also, wording signages written near the insert slot help the user. So after conducting House of Quality 1, we have also did a House of Quality 2. So following the waste bin component, so we need to understand which of the component needs to prioritize and improve. Based on the House of Quality 2, the label lid, the label lid, top head, front body, and insert slot are the things that we need to consider. The body of the waste bin itself and the divider placed in it did not show any significance. So these are some shapes that we have considered, but based on the study of Keramitsu Glue and Tragaraki, sorry, the modular bin is more acceptable. So in order to determine which among the different criteria and the different concept will be considered, we need to come up with a concept selection. So this matrix reveals that all the concepts generated were applicable in the study. We have the shake mechanism, the compressing mechanism, the modular type, specialized insert slot, attention catching label, illustration of actual items thrown, and the DLS should be in color scheme. And these are some of the criteria based on the FGD as well as the survey. We will only consider those that garnered one and two. The numbers shown means positive one, it will improve the criteria, zero, neutral, and a negative one, it will decrease. It has a negative effect on the criteria chosen. So only top one and two will be considered. So this is the alpha prototype. So the initial prototype was made of cardboard and an insert slot, and the pictures of the different trash that will be thrown are indicated on the body of the waste bin. Okay. So we've conducted uh, a testing for this, and it shows that there is still a 37.71% sorting mistake. 
We've also noticed that the insert slots were allotted based on the object most commonly thrown by the DLSU community per waste category. So the measurement of those items serves as the dimensions of the insert slot, given that the utensils and food containers were the most abundant. Each was allotted a separate slot. So this is now the improved prototype. Based on the study of Keramitsoglu and Zagarakis, 2018, they've identified that insert slot have a similar shape as to the trash that will be discarded in order to facilitate correct sorting of waste. The new prototype has a dimensions of 120 centimeter long, 35 centimeter wide, and 80 centimeter long. The findings from the initial prototype suggest that what most effectively affects waste sorting performance of the DLS, DLSU community is the size, shape, and placement of the insert slot, bean head color and design, and body color, label, and arrangement. The rectangular prism, as can be seen here, form of the waste bin was deemed to be effective in terms of the uh, key technical requirement, which is the capacity. Given the modular design of the base of the waste bin as shown in this figure, the design of the front of the body can be changed as needed. So this has a removable front body color and label. <laughs> So my dog wants to join the, the discussion. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so the improved prototype, we have included labels were also placed on top of the insert slot, where the insert slots, and it has a removable and adjustable divider inside to hold and separate the trash, the trash bag. So the prototype was tested at the Blumen Hall where students frequently purchase and consume their food. The prototype bin was placed in the area where the current DLSU bin was located and was brought to the area a few hours before the students arrived. So the first iteration of the bin shows that there is still a 14.86% sorting mistake. So we use the sliding type for separating the leftovers or the sliding mechanism. So after the, sec the second iteration, there's now only 14.29% sorting mistake. The initial target is to make it into 50%, but we are more than, uh, we, we reduce the sorting mistake to 14.29%. So upon further investigation, it was identified that there was an increase in sorting mistake due to the utensils. So this suggested that utensils should be where it would be more noticeable in this case. If the mistakes contributed by the utensils would be corrected, the percent mistakes in sorting can decrease to less than 10%. So this is now the final prototype for the bin head. So the insert slot for utensils were placed in between the biodegradable and non-biodegradable insert slots. This promotes waste sorting behavior. Its placement highlights its, ex its existence, catching the attention of the users and prompting them to store their trash. This principle was also backed up by the study of Boyce Claire about color difference. This leads the users to sort not only their utensils, but their food waste as well. Insert slot for the food box and microwave as can be seen here, were placed beside each other due to their similarity in shape. This helps users immediately find the appropriate slot for their trash and reduce the mistake where the microwaveable container gets thrown in the non-biodegradable. So in conclusion, the improvement applied to the bin lowered the inaccurately separated trash down to 14.29%, which is better than the initial aim of at most 50%. Thus, the objective of the study was achieved. 
So some possible extension of the study include redesigning the bin to better utilize space, studying the impact of effective design to the bin, making it more fun to throw your trash, attracting and eliciting emotion, and looking into the waste collection process. So let me just show you this video. Supposed to, to play. <laughs> Hold on. Let me just go to this. Uh... <laughs> on, I'll, I'll go to the. I don't know why, why it cannot be played. Sorry, bear with me. I'll just go to the, I'll go to YouTube. That's okay, Professor. Take your time. And sorry about my dog. <laughs> Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes Professor. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. That's end, that ends my presentation. 
Okay, thank you so much, Professor Jennifer, for such an interesting talk about redesigning the form and label of the waste labels of waste bins. Now, if anyone has a question, I'm sure Professor Jennifer will also please to answer. Please write, I want to ask in the chat section and we will call you to ask your question by turning on your microphone. Or you can also write down your question at the chat section. Okay, Professor, so we have a lot of um, enthusiastic participants here today. And we also have the first question from Gabriel Kathleen. Professor Jennifer, do many companies or ergonomic consultants are fuzzy theory in making an ergonomic design? I'm not familiar if they are using fuzzy logic. Sorry about that. I'm not, I'm not familiar if they are using it. My consulting project is more of uh, redesigning their workstation, like what uh, Professor Rabi presented this morning. It's more of uh, training the the workers or employees on how to use their chair properly because we've noticed based on our study that majority of people do not know that their chair are adjustable that their table are adjustable so when when the employers gave them their workstation they just sit on it and they they are afraid to adjust because they think and feel that they can <laughs> they can uh, they can do something with the chair and will result uh, from a wear and tear. So that's why they do not want to, to adjust their chair. So, but in terms of fuzzy logic, sorry, I'm not aware. I'm not familiar with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor. If anyone wants to ask to Professor Jennifer, I am inviting you all to send the chat I would like to ask or maybe just directly type what question that you will ask to professor. So we've noticed that uh, the trash can, we, we try to ignore it. We don't even think much about it. But when my student did the study, it changed my mind about the purpose really. Changing the behavior of the users is very important for them to segregate their trash. Any question? Hi, Jenny. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Maybe I can ask a question. Um, it's very interesting, Jenny, to, to hear your presentation about the uh, uh, the relation of uh, how ergonomic uh, design can play a role to persuade people in, in changing the behavior. Yes. I was wondering, uh, from your study, uh, do you think do you think there's a cultural difference, let's say, between us, let's say, Asian or South Southeast Asian people, uh, in 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 relation to how effective this persuasive design um, can change our behavior because uh, well from your study it's 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 the the Filipinos I think uh, uh, and and the Volkswagen that's uh, um, Western people so uh, yeah maybe you can share some insights uh, what do you think is there a cultural difference or is it generally persuasive design works for uh, let's say any kind of culture? Thank you. I think uh, persuasive design is will be applicable in any type of culture. But in terms of recycling, especially in our country, we are just starting to be more aware. Education really uh, of how important recycling is and segregating waste uh, will entice them also to, to segregate their waste. But redesigning it, that will include fun, like what we've shown in the last video, making it more fun, making it more natural. Because also in the design that we did, uh, we make it from left to right. Maybe culture can be a factor because in some countries they go from <laughs> right to left. So maybe that can be a factor. But we also redesigned the the bin head to make it from left to right when, when throwing your trash. So we start at the left, which is uh, segregating the food waste. And then depending on the type of uh, material that you have, whether it's a microwavable uh, storage, food storage, or it's, it's made of uh, 
paper, paper, paper cups or paper bowl, then you put that in the proper uh, segregation. But the utensil is also after after throwing the food waste. That's also the, the time that you, you, you throw your utensils. But you first start throwing your food waste with the help of the utensils as well. And we make it into a sliding mechanism. Because people do not want to, basically, people do not want to touch the trash can. Especially now because of the virus. So uh, the low touch uh, mechanism should be taken into consideration as well. Yes, thank you, Jenny. I think uh, I think in Indonesia we also uh, struggle with the same um, uh, same like changing behavior of how people deal with their food waste or any uh, general waste. So this really brings insight how ergonomic can play a role. I think uh, in uh, changing the behavior through design. So it's it's very uh, insightful. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Joanna, for that question. So just to add, I think. Uh, color coding can help. Labels will definitely help. Placing pictures uh, on the or labels on the body and as well as on the top of the the lid can help the users. And as we can see, and we what we've seen in the video, uh, it encourages people to throw their waste because they. It seems that when they throw their waste, they are throwing from a very deep bin. <laughs> so. So it encouraged more people to throw their waste. Any other question? Okay. Uh, There's a question in the chat box. Uh, did you run the demonstration of redesigned trash bin to the sum of the different society types? Uh, unfortunately, we only did the testing inside the university. So that's where uh, we did the several iterations for the prototype. But hopefully, we can also do that in the different areas like in the mall or in the park, whether that can also encourage people to, to throw their waste properly or to segregate their waste. There is also another question from Lian Ching, Professor. I would like to ask Professor Jennifer, is there any tools that you usually use to collect the data that we can use for making any product? Uh, I normally or I normally teach my student to start with the empathy map. Uh, understanding the users, how they see, how they feel, what everything of their pain and comfort. So this is the empathy map that I start with because understanding the users will definitely result to a better product. So uh, I've always stressed in my product design class that human-centric design, considering the users. What is the problem that you want to solve when designing a product? Like in the case of the waste bin, we come up with problem. Why is there difficulty in throwing their trash given the different recycling bins available? So these, we start with questions, asking questions, and the empathy map. That's the, the first thing that we do in analyzing the users. I see that um Dr. Johanna has nodding her head all the way when you are talking about the empathy map because it is about design thinking and this is what uh, she had enrolled the class in the last semester on the previous semester. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for the answer. Thank you. Thank <laughs> it, you it, also. Will be, it will be very useful and it is very exciting to talk a lot with you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd uh, just like to promote the the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society of the Philippines will have its uh, ergoneering. That's the term I coined, which means ergonomics and engineering. Uh, designing products in the change, changeable world. Because right now we're in the term of uncertainty. So I'm inviting all students to submit their design product 
uh, it will be recorded, pre-recorded, because there will be two types of uh, criteria, or what can I say, two types of judging. The first one will be through social media. So there will be 50% vote from the social media and 50% from the judges. So it will be on August 27 to 28. I will just email uh, Professor Johanna the mechanics of the, the design contest, but I encourage you all to please join that contest. On the first day, there will be some speakers as well. Uh, there will be three speakers. One is uh, Professor Rosemary Seva, Professor Stephen Poon from uh, Malaysia, and we're still talking with Dyson to be one of the speakers. And the the net, the second day will be for the judging of the design contest. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Jennifer. Now that we've heard the presentation from Prof. Jennifer, I would like to highlight just a little bit about rede redesigning the form and label of waste label of waste bin that has been delivered by Prof. Jennifer. We all know that majority of trash is remain unsegregated and incorrectly sorted, since a lot of people find it hard to sort their trash. Sorting mistakes are still high in percentage because of confusion, difficulties to sort, lack of knowledge, and etc. So the labels are important to encourage people sorting their trash. This also shows how important ergonomics in design is to almost every activity we do, as simple as disposing the waste we produce every day and even could possibly make a change in people's behavior. Right, Prof. Jennifer? Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, jo Professor Joanna. Okay, after a long session, once again, we all need to stretch out our body in accordance with our main topic about ergonomics in design. And indeed, the committee already designed this webinar to be as ergonomic as possible. Thus, we will have a break a while while you are filling out the attendance form to claim your e-certificate for five minutes. Please scan the QR code as shown at your screen or click the link that has been provided at the chat section on your Zoom meeting by the committee. Please make sure that you fill the attendance form correctly because we are going to use that information for the e-certificate. Please bear in mind that you are not leaving this Zoom meeting, but you may turn off your camera and microphone. Since my love up and got lost on me Every breath that I've been taking since you left Feels like a waste on me I've been holding on to hope that you'll come back When you can find some peace Had spoken since you left feels like a hollow street. I've been told, I've been told again. 
get you off my mind But I hope I never lose the bruises that you left behind Oh my lord, oh my lord, I need you by my side There must be something in the water Cause every day it's getting colder And if only I could hold I'm going on. your friend or anything damn you think that you're the man i think therefore i am i'm not your friend or anything damn you think that you're the man i think therefore i am stop what the hell are you talking about get my pretty name out of your mouth we are not the same with or without on top about me like how you might know how i feel top of the world but your world isn't real your world's an ideal so go have fun i really couldn't care less and you can give them my best but just know i'm not your friend or anything damn you think that you're the man i think therefore i am i'm not your friend or anything damn you think that you're the man i think therefore i am i don't
Welcome back to Ergonomics in Design webinar after you've done filling the attendance form. Please come back and present fully because you're going to hear the presentation from Ms. Dia Santi Dewi, PhD, as a lecturer from Institute Technology Sepulgo November, Indonesia. She's a lecturer at Department of Industrial and System Engineering, Institute Technology Sepulgo November, Surabaya, since 1996. currently works as Secretary of Department of Industrial and System Engineering, Treasurer of Indonesian Ergonomics Association from 2019 until 2021, PhD and Master from Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing, University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. Research interest is on human factors ergonomics, Occupational Health and Safety, Product and Service Design and Development, and Work System Design. To Ms. Bia, welcome you to deliver the presentation. Thank you, uh, Inika and Catherine. Um, did my, uh, do my voice uh, sound clear? Yes, we could hear you clearly, Professor. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, hi everyone. Thank you, Bu Jo and Pak Teddy, uh, for inviting me to this uh, webinar um, in ergonomic uh, design, which is very great event. I can see uh, until this morning uh, to the uh, third uh, presenter, which is me, uh, the participant still 300 more students. Uh, usually at the end of the event, they uh, become uh, more or less, less people joining the, the events, yeah, the webinar. So it is uh, very great. And I also see some of my colleagues from Uzu, from uh, Trisakti, Budian, and then from Poltekas and uh, University of Brawijaya and also my hometown in University of Uh, Udayana, yeah, uh, they are enjoying this event too. So uh, uh, nice to see you again in this event. Um, I'm actually uh, when uh, Bujo inviting me, and then I say that Bujo, uh, Prof Raffi here, Prof Jennifer here, and what should I uh, talk? Because uh, Prof Ravi and uh, Prof Jennifer may be already presenting something that uh, really interesting. And Bujo give me um, like a clue. Yeah, Talk about emotional design. Okay, then I will talk about emotional design. But maybe um, uh, something that relevant to it, not uh, emotional design itself, Yeah, which is about the cancer engineering. And this is uh, one of uh, my research with our team, research team in ITS, which is uh, part of three years research uh, that focusing on one area in uh, Surabaya. I will talk that later on. And now I will, uh, I will begin. Let me share my PPT. And by the way, uh, from Geneva, I am also a dog, dog lover, which is usually my dog always sit, accompany me under my table. But because today is uh, her nap time, so uh, she prefer to have a nap uh, outside. So this is it for me to do my online course. Yeah. So, but very lovely to hear your dog uh, accompany you while you on uh, do your online. Okay, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, we can, Mudia. Thank you, Patadi. <clears throat> okay, so uh, from this morning, we talk about the design and when Prof. Ravi saw the Zeus uh, pictures, I was thinking, oh, Prof. Ravi will talk about the, the fashion as well, <laughs> about shoes. Yeah. But uh, it's more like how we uh, sit and Prof. Ravi, uh, as always, uh, give a very interesting uh, topic and talk, which is I enjoy very much. That's why when Bujo asking me whether you attend from this morning, yes, of course, I don't want to miss Prof. Rafi speaks because um, I always enjoy that. And then uh, uh, Prof. Jenny also talking about the product design, but uh, I feel like, uh, feel free because, uh, oh, 
we are not talking the same thing because I will talking about the garment industry, which is a part of it, not all of this. Uh, first, I would like to uh, talk uh, a little bit about uh, the theory, which is rephrase uh, your uh, uh, knowledge. And I believe that your lecture already um, uh, give you this uh, material. So this is just like refreshing us. By the way, may I know uh, what semester most of students here? Well, mostly we are on our second year or third year, so it will be oh, approximately fourth and sixth semester. Fourth and sixth semester, and you already passed the ergonomic uh, courses, I believe? I am already, but the... My, my junior is on the oh, no. courses right now. Okay, then. All right. Then. So, uh, I will uh, show some theory uh, about the ergonomic and product design, as well as the emotional design. First, yeah. Okay, let's start. Uh, this is my uh, curriculum. Uh, just a little bit about me already being uh, mentioned uh, by Enneke. Catherine or Enneke, sorry, uh, already mentioned that in the beginning. So basically, my research interest is in uh, human factor, organomic, and product design and development. Also about the booklet analysis, safety, and ergonomic cognitive. And uh, you can see here some of the research that uh, we conducted in ITS. Uh, you can see here and also the, some of the publications. So let's continue. So what is ergonomic? I will not talking about this uh, for longer, but you know, uh, this is one of the definition that you can use or uh, usually uh, become the basis of uh, our research. Okay? Ergonomy is the scientific discipline concerned with the fundamental understanding of the interactions among humans and other elements of a system. And the professions that apply theory, principle, data, and methods to design in order to optimize human well-being and overall system performance. This is according to IEA. And then uh, from the answer that uh, student giving to the Prof. Ravi, I noticed that most of the answers is mentioning about the comfort, yeah, and then maybe a little bit about the effectiveness and efficiency and productivity today, but comfortness is always coming, yeah, comfort uh, or uh, something about the posture, our body, something like that, yeah. <clears throat> now, uh, let's see some of the domain or uh, scope of the ergonomic, which is uh, various and you can see here the ergonomics can be applied in different industry different focuses which is I uh, side two of the theory here which is first come from Sritomo Vigna Subroto my uh, lecture actually here uh, from the Mustafa Pulat and David Alexander we can see the the uh, the area where economic can be applied, which is one of them is the product design that we discussed from this morning. Yeah. Other area is like information ergonomic, physical ergonomic, and then design of workspace and work methods, and also uh, market ergonomic and maintainability. Um, when I uh, later on will discuss about the garment uh, industry, one of the implementations of ergonomic. Uh, actually, it's not uh, separate from the physical ergonomic. Yeah, so this really related. So actually, even that the the the, the scope is uh, can we can divide it, but actually one to another, it's still related. And the other uh, theory that trying to uh, classify the domain of human factor or ergonomic is uh, come from Gianni Montana, 2015, which is uh, she uh, classify into three layer, yeah, which is first start from human, 
So our concern uh, related to the human or individual is about the physiology, psychology, about their age, experience, their motivation, other ergonomic factors that related to the individual human or people. And then the second uh, domain of human factor actually about the interactions or interface, which is this uh, include uh, procedure and then physical environment, light, noise, the temperature, etc. And then also the quality and content uh, of work uh, as well as the equipment. And the third layer is about the management uh, or organization, which is here we're talking about the cultural environment, the service, the interfaces of design and communication. So Gianni Montana um, tried to uh, classify the human factor into uh, these three uh, um, area or level. Yeah. So, uh, I think if we read more book about the ergonomic or human factor, they come up with different classifications, but it's okay. Just want to know that where we can apply the ergonomic. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, one of the implementations of ergonomic is in the product design, because we're talking about this uh, from uh, this morning. So uh, I just uh, I just want to mention this uh, in brief, not in detail. Like uh, human factors in product design, actually uh, not only talking about the engineering side, which is from the engineering side, they only maybe uh, uh, focusing more on uh, the technical side, how how the product can work. But uh, the, from the ergonomic side, we want to consider uh, people or human as the main uh, focus uh, on this uh, uh, product design um, results or uh, product. So engineering is concerned with improving product from the point of view of mechanical and electrical design. And psychology is concerned with the study of the mind and behavior. And human factor and economic are concerned with adapting product to people based on or based upon their physiological and psychological capacity and limitations. Um, now we move to uh, the focus of uh, my research is. Um, ergonomic implementations in garment industry. But before we go to um, my research, uh, I would like to just give a, um, a brief idea about uh, implementation of ergonomic garment industry uh, other than patients. Yeah? Uh, so um, when I am um, looking for uh, this topic, uh, I found that previously there is still uh, or few interests about the ergonomic uh, research on the garment industry. Yeah. We more talking about the consumer product or maybe industrial product or others uh, topic, but still few about the patients or garment industry. Yeah, but later on, I will. I can. I can uh, show you. Uh, there is uh, some research uh, recently that actually inspired me. That oh, okay, uh, we can actually uh, research on this uh, topic as well. So, uh, beside the patient or um, uh, sorry, beside the the gar the the fash, um, the consumer product or industrial product. Ergonomic can be applied in garment industry, such as uh, designing the work system design, like the storage of textile material, workplaces in garment manufacturing preparations, ergonomic in cutting room, saving room, and finishing room. Also, the warehouse and distributions, and also where the cloth is stored as well as the maintenance uh, workplaces. So basically, ergonomic can be applied in a garment industry from the beginning until it can be uh, 
distribute and also store in uh, any kind of uh, store, uh, retail store, what I mean. So um, this is actually giving me the idea. Uh, I think um, I think with the increasing uh, number of industry focusing on the uh, fashion and garment uh, at the moment, this is one of the research opportunity for us to uh, do more research on this uh, area. Yeah, but uh, I'm not talking about uh, a work system design at the moment, which is uh, I more focus on uh, the fashions, the clothes, uh, something that. Um, related to the uh, the the something that we wear, yeah. So uh, if you want to see more uh, explanation about these implementations, you can see the book by Gordana Kalavik in two thousand fourteen uh, in Economic Garment Industry. I think this is a good uh, book, which is mentioning what what they do in in uh, garment industry and in government industry human factor are actually very important yeah uh, this is also relevant in uh, fashion design actually when I talking about the fashion design and garment uh, garment uh, design uh, what I understand uh, is the garment is part of the fashion design fashions could be uh, meant uh, clothes could be mean bag, shoes, accessories, hat, anything that uh, people wear uh, that related to the fashions. Yeah. So uh, human factor actually need to be considered uh, when the designer uh, design that product. Yeah. Um, now this is the research. Some of the research that I, that I found. Uh, in a fashion or garment industry. So uh, first uh, of all, uh, research by Erika who focusing on the biomechanic and fashions, which is focusing on elderly. So for me, this is interesting because uh, not many people actually aware about, aware about what uh, older people, uh, what their clothes, what what comfortable for them? Uh, we, we not really pay attention because, uh, yeah, of course, uh, most of the elderly doesn't maybe doesn't care anymore about what they they, they uh, wear as long as it's uh, comfy, comfortable. They don't care about cosy. They don't about they don't care about maybe the the uh, the uh, the models etc. As long as it's comfy, it's okay. So I think that this uh, research team is um, find something interesting uh, when uh, designing uh, a clothes for the elderly in terms of the biomechanic uh, and patients. And the other research is about the still about the elderly women. Um, this is uh, this research uh, focus on ergonomic. Uh, re issues, yeah, different issues, and they focus on that realizing that elderly have a body changes. So we need to consider that. For example, like the elderly, uh, their uh, elbow, for example, maybe um, have different uh, measure, different size, and not like a uh, young or adult people, and then. Uh, Elderly also have limitation in moving, in their motion. So we have to consider the clothes that uh, supporting their motions, make it easier for them to move. The other uh, research is about the implementations of ergonomic in our patients, which is more focusing on clothing usability. So when I read this uh, journal, I just like, wow. Uh, so usability not only about the machine, uh, customer product, uh, like our smartphone, our home appliance, not just like that. So we actually can uh, assess usability of the clothing. So that's interesting. 
And the other thing is about the implementation ergonomic in mater maternity dress design. Okay, of course, this is one of segment that um, usually uh, designer not uh, focus uh, focusing on them because yeah, this is really uh, really maybe a limited segment. Yeah, but actually they have a specific requirements because of the change of their body. So uh, if I compare uh, how the maternity dress in my uh, era uh, compared to now, I think the design now is more and more um, uh, comfortable and also uh, even that this is uh, simple but looking good. Yeah, so this giving me, uh, giving the, uh, the pregnant uh, woman something comfortable also make their confidence to wear the, the, um, the clothes. Now, uh, let's move to the emotional design. Now, uh, most study on product design have focused on customer need, concerns about their functionality and utility. Really has the issue of customer emotions been investigated? Now, traditional cognitive approaches to product usability tend to underestimate the importance of customer emotions in design. This is according to Khalid and Helanger in 2006. And uh, according to them, uh, customers actually tend to make decisions based on their feeling, perceptions of value and reflections that usually come from gut feeling rather than the logical and rational thinking. So uh, designer and manufacturing should consider making emotional design a bottom line in product design. I think I'm agree with these uh, uh, statements. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now what is the emotional design? So emotional design refer to the emotional component involved in the interactions between human and product. Yeah. This uh, term actually uh, have a similar uh, uh, word like hedonic design, affective design, affective human factor design, human center design, and empathic design. So this is different. Uh, different name for the emotional design. This is uh, according to Omarian in 2005. Now, uh, let me asking you yeah, about emotional design. Do you have something in your house that you are favorite? Uh, you you are really uh, favorite to this product, which is actually I uh, have a, a emotional attachment with you when you buy the product. Is there anyone can uh, answer this? Is there anyone here have something that have a very emotional? Uh, feeling for you no no one cell phone uh, original football jersey <laughs> my phone oh okay shoulder bag I was on to bring it <laughs> my laptop Oh, okay. I like it. Uh, my laptop. I, I sometimes uh, say that I can go anywhere alone, but not without a laptop. Laptop is my uh, good friend, good company. I feel safe when I bring my laptop, <laughs> something like that. Okay. So um, I, I just uh, remember uh, my sister who always buy a teapot every country uh, that she's visiting, uh, she has been visiting. So for example, like when they go to Korea, when she could go to Korea, they, uh, they buy a small teapot. And then when she go to Hong Kong, she buy an, a small, another small teapot and, and she not actually using that teapot. She just like to put it in the self and then just looking at that teapot. 
and I asking why you buy that teapot if you're not using that and she said that I just I just feel uh, I just like the feeling when I uh, saw the the teapot I remember uh, the good thing about that country that I have been visiting that so this is this is a kind of behavior that people uh, like to do when they buy something so uh, designers should I think don't overlook these uh, emotions uh, because this actually influence the customer to buy something so um, I think similar to your laptop your bag yeah maybe uh, outside there there is a very good a uh, bag uh, available in the market but you always love your bag because this bag already accompany you uh, so many times then there is a, a lot of memory for that bag yeah maybe like that so if someone told you to please discard your bag just buy the new one because it look very ugly for example no you don't want to uh, uh, throw it away because there are so many memory on that yeah like uh, you for the girl for example you maybe have still have a, a doll in your uh, room which is already not pretty as new but you are love very much that doll for example yeah so based on neurobiological theory of emotion, there is a le three level um, of emotional design, which is visceral, behavioral, and reflective. And the visceral level is about the, the initial impact of the product, about its appearance, thoughts, and feel. You can feel it. Yeah? And then the second one is the behavioral, behavioral level concerns the pleasure and effectiveness of use and the experience with the product. So uh, experience itself has different facets, like uh, functions, for example, like what the product is meant to do and then performance, how well the product carries out the desired function and usability and uh, how easily uh, the user can understand how it works and how to get into the perform. And also the reflective level, which is related to the rationalizations and intellectualizations of the product. It is creating a good memories for the users, like the bag, for example, like the teapot that I mentioned before. Okay, so this is some of the research in product design and emotion design in fashions and uh, garment industry. For example, like um, uh, research by Simon uh, Teresa uh, in emotional design of fashions, development and application of new tool for non interfering research, focusing in a method uh, to do the research, yeah, because uh, they think that people sometimes are reluctant to. Um, uh, to involve in a research because this is uh, inform them uh, when they are in the in the process. Yeah. And then uh, the other research is about the fashions and ergonomic design aspect that influence the perception of clothing. Oh, sorry, this is the 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 oh yeah misplaces yeah that like the previous one. This is the emotional one yeah emotional design. Now. We move to uh, to our uh, research. So uh, this is uh, the research that uh, we uh, conduct uh, for. This is part of three years research as that I mentioned before. And my team is including me and also my student Aditya and also my colleague Walidio Hadi, uh, and then Stiawans and then Ekadian Safitri and Ovianti Eka Sari Eka Sari. So, uh, I start with the batik. Why batik? As we know that batik is a cultural heritage of Indonesia that have been passing through the generation for a century. And then uh, we already aware that in, in Indonesia have different uh, unique motif, very various, and some of the batik can be easily distinguished uh, related to uh, a area or regions like a batik pekalongan. They have uh, they have a special 
um, motif that people will uh, recognize that uh, the 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 design the the, the motif design and then uh, there is a batik Yogyakarta, batik Solo, batik Madura have different kind of motif uh, with the batik Solo and then we also know uh, batik Cirebon and batik Tuban and all this batik can be distinguished based on the patterns, the motif and the colors. Yeah, Batik patterns Patterns is a pictures on paper which will later be transferred to the batik garment or clothes. And usually the pattern will reflect the various elements of the nature, the technology, yeah, like the nature, what I mean, like uh, fruit, uh, uh, some of the, their uh, plant, their flower, their um, animal, sometimes like that. Yeah. As you can see here, it is reflecting a bird, yeah. And then also uh, they related to the geomet. Uh, sorry, the, the the element also about the geometry and uh, various abstract forms, which is uh, now you can uh, see a lot of different patterns available in the market. So uh, the patterns now is more. Uh, more different uh, compared to the traditional um, patterns yeah. and so, so uh, the batik patterns uh, what is the batik pattern it's like actually a main ornament uh, pattern that determine the meaning of the motif and also including what we call isen isen, yeah, isen isen like a variety of fabric filler patterns and em in empty fill of batik pattern. So if you see like a dot in uh, empty space, like the uh, picture in your right uh, hand, my right hand, you can see there is a dot there that is an isen, which is filled in the empty uh, space in the uh, batik uh, garment. And then uh, beside batik patterns, there is a batik shape. So uh, people are actually uh, classifying uh, the batik shape differently, but some of them is, is uh, I put it here, like uh, batik shape, shape including geometric decorative patterns. Yeah. So uh, this is like a line and wake elements such as slices, caves, rectangles, yeah. trapezoidal, rhombus, and many more. And there is a non-geometric decorative pattern, uh, a pattern with an arrangement that cannot be defined with certainly. So um, so this is about the batik pattern and batik shape. Now, I'm actually uh, preparing uh, this quiz, yeah? uh, actually not a quiz, like uh, ask, uh, the questions for you. Um, I you still have energy to do the Mentimeter quiz? Of course, Miss. We are all <laughs> okay. excited to try to do Mentimeter. <laughs> uh, this is just one question, actually. Uh, let me um, just uh, hang on. Just let me preparing the Menti um, quiz. Uh, can you, okay, I might need to give you uh, the, the code. So this one. Okay, and let me see. Whether my menti, oh, I didn't put my sound, is work or not. So, can you see my screen? Yeah, yes, miss. Yeah. I can see yeah. clearly. Can you get into the menti? Yes, I could get into the menti and. Okay, I will start. The I will start. 
then sorry oh great it's starting so yeah one one okay next okay i will share this so you can see the results okay pattern okay design the price yeah of course the price yeah um uh, the material and motif yeah design still number one yeah for your choice yeah i uh in here there is a 300 participants so i expect this word cloud will be very busy <laughs> yeah let me see whether the um oh you're not you're not seeing my uh, results you can see it miss you already oh, okay. presenting yeah. the share screen okay price color the design the design still number one and then pattern price i think number three i still give a music on it just a minute just a minute keep put your answer on it nine who participate so far One hundred. We will waiting until uh, one hundred fifty maybe participant who respond to this answer. I'm still looking for the the song. <laughs> Okay, design and patterns still become the second biggest answer. One hundred twenty eight participants. Still 147, three more and we close.
Okay, 155. Okay, we can stop now, I think. So, 150 students uh, or participants here uh, choose the design, the patterns, and I think the price as well as the material uh, that become the, the most uh, answered yeah, from the participants. Okay, that's great. Uh, I believe the design, what you mentioned here, is more related to the design of the, the, the clothes, right? Is there anyone here answer that questions and thinking about the design of the batik pattern of motif? Is there anyone? Okay, I, I assume that most of the students thinking about the design of the clothes, yeah, not the motif. Um, all right, uh, let's move uh, move on to my uh, slides. So, okay, um, I'm actually interesting to know uh, whether one of you thinking about the when you choosing the the batik uh, clothes, you thinking about the motif or the color, yeah, something like, or maybe uh, something that remind you about some things, yeah, emotional feeling, yeah. Okay, uh, this is what actually we thinking when we choose this topic about the uh, this research. Yeah, our research is. Um, try to help the some of the uh, batik store owners in uh, Dolly and Jarak Kampung uh, to design their uh, to design their uh, batik yeah uh, for those who don't know what is the Dolly and Jarak area or maybe I refer the question is there anyone know Dolly and Jarak area in Surabaya Is there anyone know about that? Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lian, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Lian Singh has been there. Okay. That's a prostitute area. Okay. Why I mention this? Yeah, because for Surabaya, this is a big project. Uh, previously, Dolly and Jarak, uh, uh, Dolly and Jarak, uh, area is known well known as uh, uh, the biggest prostitute area even it is uh southeast asia that's what the the source mentions it is very big um and in fact uh, some people for uh, outside um, the island sometimes when they go to surabaya they're asking about where is the dolly and jarak area and uh, this uh, for Surabaya people, Dolly and Jarak area, uh, it's considered a not really, uh, how to say it, appropriate uh, area to develop. That's why in 2015, uh, the governors, Burisma, maybe you hear the, the news about that, closed that area. Of course, there is a lot of, you know, rejections demonstrations people not agree when they uh, the government closed that area because for some people who live there they really uh, have a very easy money uh, source of income for them yeah uh, because of this area but because of is java is like a very a religious uh, community they consider this area should be uh, disclose, yeah. That's why governments insist to close this area. Uh, the thing is for the community, they lost their job. They don't have money, yeah. So we need to help them. And for that, the government already try every effort, every way, every uh, whatever they, they, they think it will work for this community. 
and university and also the uh, private company also try to help the government and the community to develop the area in order to uh, prevent the community to uh, open again the area. But from 2014 until now, is I think it's not that success. Yeah, the people still uh, complain that they don't have uh, stable income, resource on income, uh, and they very hard to get money. Yeah, but yeah, we still try. One one of the attempt for them to help them is like. Um, help them to develop their batik uh, product which is actually uh, Dolly and Jarak do have the batik uh, which is uh, they, they claim that uh, very unique and is related to their area and the unique characteristic of batik Dolly is the Jarak leaf or fruit yeah and butterfly yeah that's what they say that this is our uniqueness of uh, our motif. But the thing is, um, their batik is not so popular. Even even the product, they, they do have uh, some order for their batik, but it actually not real um, order. They come from the government or any institutions that actually want to support them. Yeah. Uh, the reasons why it is not really popular because uh, the uh, craftsmanship or pengrajin's batik there is lack of knowledge on how to making a batik and their uh, derivative product. Uh, and then um, this is something that we need to help. Yeah. So what we're thinking is how to design, help, help them to design a new dolly batik design, which is hopefully more uh, more interest many people uh, to buy from that area. So our research aim is knowing the factors that influence customer reference in choosing a dolly batik design, and also helping them to designing dolly batik uh, dolly batik design based on the design element desired by the market, and then also in politely, indirectly helping um, the uh, community to de develop their uh, area ex localization story and jarak uh, particularly in uh, batik now uh, we decide to use the kanse engineering approach uh, for um, developing uh, the design as a beginning, um, uh, how to say it, as a tools for the beginning state of product design development. And before we talking about the concept engineering, uh, let me refresh you about the, the concept of concept engineering. So uh, according to Lee Dokes, yeah, in product design, uh, separating emotion from cognitions is a major weaknesses of psychology and connective science. So, according to Lee Dogs, when we con when we thinking about the product or different interact interactions, emotion and connection can be separated. Yeah, cognitive and affective process have been taken into account for both product and service interactions, and the cognitive aspect of usability is um, related to something like ease of use, identification, and trust. And the affective aspect of usability is including colors, image, shapes, and perceptions uh, of information system. Now, uh, cancer engineering related to the affective. Uh, aspect. So uh, this is uh, a bit theory from Helander and Khalid, where uh, here you can see the uh, framework um, that can source a system uh, for identifying and evaluating various human factor issues, yeah, especially in a product uh, design. Uh, the purpose is to illustrate uh, to illustrate the design tool that the designer might use to achieve effective design and how the user might perceive and react to the design. 
yeah okay i will not talking this uh into detail i just want to show you we cannot separate between uh, cognitive and affective design even for the product design so let's go to the cancer engineering um have you uh, got the material for, uh, about the cancer engineering in one of your uh, course maybe uh, the student from the third uh, years have you got this from Pak Teddy or Bujo? <laughs> Forgot, it's okay. <laughs> all right, uh, only one answer, but maybe not represent all the audience. That's okay. Uh, I will uh, refresh you again. So the cancer engineering is a method to translate cons a consumer image or feeling of consumer into real design component. This is according to Mitsuo Nagamachi. And uh, the term can say uh, defined as uh, organized state of mind in which emotions and image are held in the mind toward physical objects such as the product or the environments. And can say engineering application you uh, actually can um, can be conducted uh, by using different uh, approachings. But the most common one is the cancer engineering type ones because this is the most easiest, I think, yeah, the most easiest to apply. So uh, basically the process is like this. So you have to put design of strategy, put your uh, what you want to focus on and then collecting of the cancer word and then you have to develop the, uh, the questionnaire, the semantic differential scale and then do uh, experiments and uh, collect some data and then after that you do some statistical analysis until you can uh, interpret and analyze the data and use that for uh, uh, product design uh, uh, development. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually learned this cancer engineering from my colleagues, pa Marcus Hatono from University of Ubaya. I remember or the C, uh, he is the first one that uh, inspiring me uh, to do this um, research. Okay. I probably need to be more quick because I'm already uh, be warning about the times. So, yeah. Uh, so, here what we do. Sorry. So, the first ones is we do uh, segmentations, which is uh, for this research, we focus on uh, customer or uh, respondent, which is a young respondent between 18 or 30 years old. We think that this uh, particular segmentations um, is will be a great uh, market for batik, uh, and they actually are more familiar and more uh, prefer to use or to wear a uh, batik. Yeah, so it is common to see young people wearing a batik uh, recently, not like uh, in um, um, previous years. Yeah, and then we involve a uh, res respondent uh, like 55 male and female respondent and we focusing on uh, our research in strawberry city and we actually do some initial research which is we uh, our team come to like uh, exhibitions yeah batik exhibition and then asking the uh, the customer what actually they want uh, or they're looking for for the batik and then from that we come up with uh, differential semantic with 22 can say work that we will consider for the further uh, analysis and then uh, we design 11 batik design sample for the research and asking the respondent to uh, give the their opinion about the the design and then this is the profile of the respondent, which is uh, most of them is female. And then most of them is between 20 and 25 years old. Uh, also, they mention about um, um, most of them like have four or seven pieces of batik clothes. Um, 
uh, and they say that they more like to buy uh, upper clothes like yeah, t-shirts, like uh, uh, um, shirts, yeah, than the bottom clothes. Yeah. And this is uh, the 22 uh, Kansai word list that we uh, collect uh, and we will use this uh, in our questionnaires, like proud, classy, elegant, beautiful, etc. Actually, these uh, uh, 22 Kansai words uh, we got from uh, the Kansai, uh, 72 Kansai words that we, we found from other journal. Yeah? And this is the, the questionnaire that we use. And as you can see here, we ask uh, our respondent uh, to feel the semantic differential, uh, the, the differential semantic questionnaire by uh, assessing the design that we uh, give it to them, like 11 design. What is the 11 batik design samples? This, uh, you can see here. This is actually um, the design was created by students of the Department of Design Product. So uh, one of our team is a, a lecturer from Design Product and they uh, have a project for the students. Please create a different kind of batik motif, which is can be used for the the research yeah every design uh we call d1 until d11 uh, have a uh, different uh different story <laughs> different different uh design yeah and then uh after we asking them and then we have the data uh, then we can do the statistical process which is first we have to do the like a validity and reliability test uh, from where that uh, we found that from 18 uh, from 20 keyword uh, uh, can say word only 18 who is valid and uh, for that we can uh, this we can process more uh, to uh, factor analysis uh, factor analysis process and we can find like from this 18 can say word four factor that is dominant and then after that uh, we uh, now try to develop the item design this is uh, decisions and category which is the result is like there are seven categories and 18 items that is correlated to the four factors and at the end, we use a PLS analysis to see which one is from seven preference, uh, from seven category become the preference uh, for uh, the batik dolly design. So this is the recapitulation of the data. As you can see here, there is a 22 Kansi word we use, and then there is 11 batik design. Uh, and then this is the average, uh, average score that they uh, put it on the questionnaire and then this is the validity test yeah so uh, here is the result of factor analysis which is you can see here the psychological which is emotional the feeling is um, have a higher points yeah meaning that this is the the most uh, preference factors and then color motif and style yeah uh, at the beginning i'm i actually asking a question because i want to know what, what whether our result is quite similar with your choice or not yeah and this is the item and category um here we try to uh, as i mentioned before there is uh, 18 uh, items that we found yeah and then it goes down to seven uh, uh, category like pattern characteristic main ornament supporting element etc and uh, when we do this we actually brainstorm the result with the designer interior uh, to have their opinion about the result whether this is um, this is already uh, uh, close to the what the designer knowing about the design aspect of the batik and then this is the BLS analysis where here we want to know which factor that most uh, important for the 
responden. So uh, the result is uh, we found that based on the 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 efforts of the result, we found like um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Um, seven aspects that very important uh, to be considered in designing batik uh, garment like for first of all is the main colors uh, the respondent like the bright colors uh, such as yellow and white all around the batik ornament and then supporting ornament uh, they like um, like custard leaf uh, and then supporting ornament like oval with bamboo patterns and also uh, for the main ornament, there is a flora, floral ornament, namely Jaya Vijaya flower, and then Aizen batik with one Aizen. And for the sporting color, they like the dark color, namely, which is like a blue navy uh, in the back of batik uh, motif. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think this... Uh, also, thank you for the reminder. Uh, yeah. uh, this is the conclusions. So this, I think this is the end of my presentation. So uh, what become our conclusion is, uh, yeah, uh, we, we conclude that uh, for designing the batik, psychological color pattern and motif is important thing. Yeah. And this result is closely to what designer uh, uh, think uh, about how to design the batik motif. Uh, but the proposed batik design still need to be tested, uh, actually, uh, to to get more feedbacks whether what we think, uh, the result of these results, is actually can help designer to develop different kind of batik patterns. Yeah, we still uh, try to uh, to uh, continue the research and uh, this research actually we try to publish it in a, a journal it's still under process yeah hopefully it can be accepted yeah so i think that's all of my presentation sorry for running uh, run out the times uh, i go back the time for uh, from the, uh, to the mc um catherine or Enika. Okay, thank you, Miss Dia, for a very comprehensive talk about ergonomics, especially in emotional design. I also feel like the majority of us could relate about the emotional attachment to a specific thing. And again, if anyone has a question or something to ask to Miss Dia, please write I want to ask in the chat section. And we'll call you to ask your question by turning on your microphone, or you can also write down your question at the chat section. But due to the time constraint, we'll open for only one question. So if you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask your question. There's one question in the chat box. Yeah. Go. So okay. this is from the. I'm sorry. I can see the. Maybe I have to. Um, from Gabriel. I would like to ask, is it necessary to remember emotional design experience first, despite all aspects that are common to human beings, such as specific characteristics and unique combinations of reference to each person has? Okay, uh, so uh, I guess this is uh, from, you asking from the designer uh, perspective, yeah, whether that we uh, design the, the product and consider the emotional uh, design first, the emotional aspect first, then other things like uh, the function maybe <laughs> the function and then the appearance and etc uh, for my perspective uh, I think is first the designer need to understand who they want to uh, design so uh, knowing your customer is the most initial important uh, the most important initial step. So, regarding to that segmentation, you need to understand what become the most valuable thing for them. Some people put emotional thing more important than others. Of course, the basic thing, the basic thing should be in the product, like a functionality, uh, the forms, uh, it should be there. Like the uh, teapot, for example, the teapot function is for, yeah, you know, to drink uh, tea, for example. So, this is should be uh, uh, safe enough to 
to put hot water on it and then you can hold it for simple like that but the other aspect uh, is very uh, related to your segments if you think the emotional thing can be uh, very important for your customer you should uh, consider that yeah but maybe other customer like uh, other segment more put price on it yeah you, of course you should uh, consider that first yeah. so whether you uh, uh, put the emotional design first or the second or the third is depending on who is your segment you have to understand for some customer segment emotional thing a small emotional aspect is very important other than other factors so uh is that answering your questions? Okay, Gabriel. Is there any other questions? Okay, would be yeah, maybe we come to our end because we have time constraint for today's event. Once again, thank you very much, Budia, for the comprehensive explanation about emotional design, about human factors, especially in the garment industry, which have a lot of stages and a lot, lot of level to produce some fashion products, as we've said before. For example, for, for example, the biomechanics in fashion for the elderly woman, which have difference in the size for certain body parts between the elderly and the youngsters. And also due to the limitations in the, in the motion, we need to care about how we need to support the elderly motion to move. And we now all know about emotional design, which can trigger the decision that made by the customers that often based on their feelings, perceptions, values, and reflections, because emotional design involved in the interaction between the human and the product. Lastly, the method that Budia said before is about Kansei engineering that is also already been learned in the product ergonomics class, but maybe not for the ergonomics class one means. But for the other that not know yet, maybe you could dig more about what Kansei Engineering is. All the sessions have been delivered by our great speakers today, by Professor Rafi, Professor Jennifer, and also Budia. And we are now uh, going to the last session for today's webinar. Today we have Dr. Johanna Harianja as the head of Center for Economics at Industrial Engineering Parahyangan Catholic University 2021 until 2025 that was appointed two days ago. He is also very excited to give closing remarks for today's event to Bujo. The moment is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, so yes, uh, thank you for all participants, uh, dear students and colleagues, especially the ones uh, still staying staying tuned here until now and, and spending your basically the whole Saturday morning together in this webinar. I think we all, we all agree that we have learned a lot from our three speakers. Uh, it has brought us uh, new insights and also reminded us on the importance of ergonomics in design, especially related to body posture, how we should sit better, uh, persuasive design related to uh, waste management and also emotional design related to batik design or products. So my ultimate uh, gratitude goes to uh, my dear three friends slash colleagues, uh, to Rafi, to Jenny and to Budia for sharing so much knowledge with us uh, today. Well, personally, I see that's, that there's a so many works to be done, need to be done, so much room for us to collaborate further, either in education, research, or community service to make our Indonesia more ergonomic. So at the Center uh, for Ergonomics UNPAR, which I was appointed indeed, uh, the head uh, uh, as a follower of Patedi Yoga Sara two days ago, exactly. Well, we believe in the value of collaboration across borders and disciplines. So therefore we are open for collaboration with everyone in the field of ergonomics and design. So please feel free to reach out to us for any possible collaboration in education, research or community service. 
So before um, we close this uh, webinar, I also would like to thank the organizing team um, for our collaboration in making this webinar happen and has uh, run very smoothly as well. With this, I close this webinar and wish you all a very nice weekend. And the most important thing is to do uh, is uh, do stay healthy in this pandemic time and good afternoon and thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, Dr. Johanna Harianja, for giving the closing statement. As we finish our webinar today, would like to inform all part participants about the e-certificate that will be sent at your email. So don't forget to check your email and download your e-certificate later. We are very thankful for the participation of all participants that have joined Ergonomics in Design webinar today that come from four, that come from a variety of institutions, both the professionals and the students. We are also very grateful for Professor Rafindra Gunatilaka, Professor Alma Maria Jennifer Gutierrez, and Ibu Dia Santi Dewi PhD's attendance as our speakers today, and your willingness to share all of the learnings and experience in your professional field. Once again, don't forget the attendance form that will be used to claim all the participants' e-certificate. So if you need to get one, I remind you to, to fill the attendance form here that have been presented. Also, would like to apologize if there is any inconvenience and mistake in pronouncing the names. I'm Anita. And I'm Catherine. Goodbye and see you in another opportunity. Thank you. The recording Thank you has for stopped. joining us. You in another webinar. Thank you, Father D. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you everyone.